All right, well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, to those of you who w weren't here last time, uh, welcome. And to those of you who were here last time, welcome back. Um, so before we get into the lecture today, I'm just going to give a little bit of admin info. So I've just been notified that the video um, from last week, from last week's lecture, is going to be available online sometime this week. So if you did miss that first lecture last week, you'll be able to go back and watch that and, and review that just to get yourself up to speed. Um, and so until then, I've been uploading all the material up to my personal, personal GitHub webpage. And so I upload all of the slides, and I'll try to upload the slides um, either the night before or the morning of each remaining lecture. So I did that today. So here's, here's the link for, for that. Um, an, an easy way to get there is just to search on Google GitHub, and then just my name, and then it should be the first hit. But if you go there, um, you can see two different folders. We have one folder with, uh, where I'll post all the slides, and I'll have a second folder here where I'll po post the tutorial material. So here I have the, uh, the data set, the SPSS data set from the first lecture, and that's also going to be the, the tutorial data set from today's lecture. And I will post um, some instructions. I just haven't gotten around to that yet. I spent a lot of time making up all these slides. But I'm hoping to complete that for you by the end of today. So have the tutorial from the, the first uh, lecture and for today's lecture by the end of today. OK. Yeah, so tutorials posted there and also I'll just give you my email address, so if you have any questions about the lectures or about the tutorials or anything like that, feel free to just uh, send me an email. All right, so last time, uh, we, we talked about a lot, a lot last time. I remember I was talking to a friend of mine uh, last week about all the things I went through in, this, in the first tutorial, and she said to me, wow, that's a lot, because um, normally, uh, when you do an introductory statistics sort of course, you go th through things very, very slowly, but unfortunately we don't have enough time, so I have to sort of skim over everything. But, so last time we talked about the differences between our population parameters and statistics. So our population parameters are the things that we're interested in studying in, uh, the things that we're interested in studying, and they uh, help us describe the distribution of values, of, uh, the distribution of all values in a population. And conversely, statistics are quantities that we calculate from our data. So calculate from the quantities that we have in our data. And so we define some very simple descriptive statistics like our mean, median, mode some statistics uh, for variation like uh, variance and standard deviation, and we showed some very simple types of plots. And so really the focus of this first uh, tutorial was to um, look at some tools for doing a simple data exploration. And I stress the importance of doing a simple data exploration when you're first starting out, not to jump into any statistical tests right away and just see what you can find. And so we know how to calculate estimates of several simple population parameters. So we have our, our sample mean, we have um, our sample standard deviation, but we don't know anything yet about declaring significance. And when I say significance, I mean determining whether or not what we saw in our sample was attributable to chance or not. And so by considering this, we're entering a world of statistics or a, a sort of field of statistics that's called hypothesis testing. All right, so before we even start our statistical test, we need to think about our research question we need to define whatever parameter we're interested in. 
and we need to define how we're going to test the parameter. So if you imagine uh, a scenario where we're looking at comparing the, the average lifespan at birth uh, in men versus women, you can think of our parameters of interest being average lifespan in men and average lifespan in women. And the way that those parameters are being tested is they're being tested for equality. And the way we characterize our hypothesis test is by two uh, hypotheses, sort of opposites of each other, that describe two possible states of the world. So one we call the null hypothesis, which we uh, abbreviate as H0. And we have our alternate hypothesis or alternative hypothesis, which we abbreviate as H1, or sometimes you'll see it written as H sub A. And the way we set up these two hypotheses usually boils down to something like, I'm simplifying this a little bit, but the null hypothesis is there's not really anything interesting, and the alternate hypothesis is, okay, well, maybe there's something interesting to see here. And one thing that I should stress is that's as far as we go with statistical testing. All we, all we can ever do is find evidence uh, in favor of either hypothesis, but we can never prove either hypothesis. Okay, so I'll give you a few examples. So let's say we take um, a sample of grad students at McGill and an IQ test is administered. And the question we're interested in uh, answering is, do McGill grad students have different IQ on average than the general population? So general population IQ is uh, fixed to be 100 by construction. Notice how I didn't uh, say, we're, we're not investigating whether they have a higher IQ on average, just whether they have a different IQ on average. And we do have statistical tests to investigate um, kind of a one-sided test like that, whether one thing is greater than the other, but it's best to uh, go into a statistical net test in an agnostic way. So we don't suppose one way or the other, even if we have some sort of inkling as to which uh, direction it's going to go. So our null hypothesis is just going to be average IQ in McGill grad students. So really that's our parameter of interest is equal to 100. And our alternate hypothesis is average IQ uh, of these grad students is not equal to 100. So another example is uh, mean survival time, say, in, in cancer patients. So say we have an existing drug A, and we're comparing to uh, a new drug B. And so we, yeah, we're interested in the mean survival time. So our null hypothesis in this case is going to be mean survival time is the same between our two groups, and the alternate is the mean survival time differs between the two groups. Okay, so in those last two examples, I defined the null and alternate hypotheses in terms of words, and that's fine, that's totally fine, but usually we um, define them in terms of some sort of equation or inequality. And the point is these equations always involve the parameters. They never ever involve the statistics. So in our IQ example, let's say X bar is the mean IQ of our sample of McGill grad students and mu is uh, so X bar is the sample of students and mu is the mean among all McGill grad students. So we can rewrite our, our hypothesis in this case as H zero, our null is mu is equal to 100 and our alternate is uh, mu is not equal to 100. And what you should never write, this is something that you know, you'll see every now and then, you should never write x bar equals 100, x bar does not equal to, to, to 100. Because of course, we, we directly observe the value of x bar. We, we, that's something that we see in our sample, and so we know that x bar is not equal to 100. 
So really we're making inference on a population parameter and X bar is just something that is going to help us make inference on that parameter. <coughs> Okay, so when we do a, a hypothesis test, there are sort of four ways it can happen represented in this table. So uh, in the column zero here, I have reality, what's, uh, what the truth is. So our two scenarios are, our null hypothesis is false, which would mean that there is something interesting to find in our data. Well, I shouldn't say in our data, there is something interesting uh, in the general population. And the other case is the null is true. So that means that uh, there's really nothing interesting to find uh, in this relationship. And on the rows, I have our statistical test. So we can either reject the null hypothesis. So that means we declare that we've found something significant or so I don't agree with the terminology used in this graphic here. They say accept H0, but I prefer the term do not reject H0. Um, and so that just means that we, um, we declare that there is no significant finding in our results. So if, we, if in reality the null hypothesis is false, then that means there is something to find. And if we reject the null hypothesis, okay, well, we're cor we were correct. And if, we, if, if in reality the null hypothesis is true, so there's nothing interesting to find, and we do not reject the null hypothesis, then we would also be correct. Um, so something I'm going to talk about later on when we do uh, uh, power calculation and sample size calculation. Um, I'm going to talk about kind of the probability that uh, that given there is something uh, to find in reality that we reject the null hypothesis. So this is something that's called power or more commonly in biomedical uh, sciences and in in epidemiology we refer to that as sensitivity. And then the other way we can be correct we usually, the, the, the probability that uh, we're correct in the other way, given that uh, the null hypothesis is true, is called specificity. So I'll go more into that in our very last lecture. And we also have two different types of errors that we can make. We have what's called a type one error. So that's kind of like finding a false positive. We declare that there's something there when there's really not. And type two error, uh, false negative. So we, we say that there's nothing there when there really is something there to find. Okay, so the way we do a hypothesis test is we start by assuming our null hypothesis and we collect our data and we do our statistical test through something called a test statistic. And we decide on the, so we, we measure our level of evidence through this test statistic. And if we have enough ev evidence, then we reject our null hypothesis, and otherwise we do not reject the null hypothesis. And so yeah, as I said, I, I disagreed with the, um, with the wording in that last graphic. I thought it was a good graphic otherwise, but we, we never actually accept either hypothesis. We either reject the null hypothesis or we do not reject the null hypothesis. And so the, I, I think of, uh, hypothesis testing as being kind of like a, a criminal trial. So in a criminal trial, you, uh, the defendant, you start by assuming that the defendant is innocent, and then the prosecutor will present all the evidence, and we do not declare uh, the defendant to be guilty until we think that that's true beyond some reasonable doubt, until we have enough evidence. And the reason I like that um, that sort of analogy is because you can think of a type one error as being um, sending uh, an innocent person to prison. And you can think of a type two error as uh, setting a guilty person free. And so usually, th this isn't always true in a hypothesis testing, but usually in hypothesis testing, we consider a type one error to be more serious. So if you, th so in the criminal uh, trial 
analogy. Uh, we usually think of uh, putting an, in, an innocent person in prison as being worse than setting a, a guilty person free. And so, we, yeah, yeah, we generally see the same thing in hypothesis testing. We would rather not declare that something is significant when it's not really significant. Um, there are some cases where the, the opposite is true. I won't get into that right now, but I would say it's much more common for us to want to wanna minimize our, our type one error rate. All right, so I mentioned this idea of a test statistic. And this test, this test statistic is going to involve three components. So the first one is it's going to involve an estimate of the parameter of interest. That makes sense. You know, we want to estimate whatever we're actually studying. The second thing is a measure, a variation of this estimate. And this is just going to give us an idea of how reliable the estimate is. And so if we have a more reliable estimate, we're more likely to believe our results. The last thing is the sample size. So if we say if we see, um, if, if we're looking at differences between the means of two groups and we see a large difference between the means of those two groups in our estimate of the parameter of interest, but we have a, a small sample size, we're less likely to, be, to believe that result than if we had seen that same mean difference in a larger sample size. So the first thing and the, the last thing are usually the easier things to calculate. Sample size is just given to you right off the bat. The estimate of the parameter of interest is usually just calculating some sort of uh, statistic. But the tricky part is this measure of the variation of our estimate. So I'm going to do a quick illustration of this. So if you remember last time I defined our normal distribution. So here's an example of a normal distribution that's centered around the value 100. So it's mean, median, and mode are all at 100. And it has a, a standard deviation sigma of 15. And so if you re remembered, that would mean that uh, about two thirds of our data are going to fall between the values of 85 and 115. So one standard deviation in either direction. And um, and about 95% of our data is going to fall within two standard deviations of either direction, so between 70 and uh, 130. So the point is that this, this curve um, applies, to, uh, the, uh, applies to the variable of interest in our population. So let's say we were able to take four separate samples from this population. Normally when you're doing sampling, you only take one sample, but so because I can work with simulated data, I can take as many samples as I want from the population. So just using statistical software, I took four samples from that population. So in our first sample, we see our histogram, and it looks somewhat like the true population. We see, you know, it's kind of, kind of bell-shaped and maybe centered around 100, maybe a little uh, less than 100. In our second sample, we see it's kind of skewed a little bit to the right. In our third sample, we see something a little bit weird. We see that there's this kind of spike just below 100, and then it drops down above 100. And then in sample four, we see, again, a weird spike over here on the right side of 100. And by the way, all these samples are of size 50. So the point is that if you, if you take um, repeated samples from your population, you're going to get slightly different results every single time. And if we calculate the sample means in each one of these samples, they range from 95 to 102. So sometimes when you take a sample, you're gonna underestimate your true population mean, and sometimes you're going to overestimate your true population mean. So we want a way to be able to quantify this variation over all possible samples. So it turns out that 
if we were to consider all possible samples of size 50 from this distribution, and we were to calculate X bar in each one of those samples, X bar itself would follow a normal distribution. So now, this is when things get a little bit tricky because we're talking about something really theoretical. We're talking about the sampling distribution of, um, of a statistic, of X bar. So yeah, so we have a fixed sample size of 50. Here in, in the blue, I have our population distribution as before. So that's, again, that's referring to uh, the values of the variable of interest in the population. And this green curve in the middle represents the distribution of all possible values of X bar if we had taken a sample of size 50. As you can see, the, the variation is a lot smaller than the, the overall uh, distribution. Makes sense, so if you were to get some extreme values on, on one side of your distribution, they would probably be balanced out by some extreme values on the other side of the distribution. The main takeaway point from this is if this green curve is, is very, if, if, if it has a large variation, then that means we're going to be less uh, confident in our estimate of X bar. And if this green curve is very tight around uh, the population mean, then that means we're going to be very, we're going to be very confident about our estimate of X bar, of the, of the population mean. Okay, so, so yeah, just reiterating here what I just said, this sample distribution, this sample statistic distribution is also normally distributed and we're really interested in studying the amount of variation in this distribution. And as it turns out, there's a, there's a really nice formula for the variation, for the standard deviation of, of our sample mean. And so if our population distribution has a standard deviation of sigma, and we take samples of size n, then over all possible samples, the standard deviation of all these sample means is just going to be sigma divided by the square root of n. So this is a quantity known as the standard error of the mean. Um, sometimes it's just referred to as uh, the standard deviation of x bar, but very commonly referred to as the standard error of the mean. So this thing is going to help us in our hypothesis testing. It's going to give us a value of um, certainty of our estimate of x bar. So normally, however, so th this value involves a population parameter sigma. So normally we don't know what the true value of sigma is. And so it's something that has to be estimated. So as it turns out, there's an easy solution to this. All we do is we, as we saw last week, we can get our estimate of sigma as being the sample standard deviation. So we just calculate our uh, sample mean X bar. We look at um, the square differences between each of our data points and the sample mean. And we divide by N minus one and just take the square root of the whole thing. And so then we can just plug this in and get an estimate of the standard error of the mean. And so when I, a notation that I'm gonna use throughout this series is if I put a hat, a little hat over something, that just means it's an estimate of the population version of the quantity. So a very simple measure of standard error of the mean, S divided by root N. So even though this is an estimated value of the standard error of the mean, for some reason this is also called the standard error of the mean. Don't ask me why, I don't know what genius came up with that, but um, we, we actually more commonly, uh, when we say standard error of the mean, we refer to this estimated quantity rather than the true quantity. All right, so that was a little bit theoretical. So maybe, maybe that was a little bit too much, but I'm just using that to get us into uh, 
uh, the notion of the t-test. Can I ask you a quick question sure. before we go on? Does anybody have any questions first? No? Okay. Um, with respect to the standard error of the mean, just to, to clarify, that is really the means of independent experiments. It is not appropriate to use a standard error of mean if you have sample one and you want to take the standard deviation of your n of 50 and then take a, an SEM of 50. I just want to clarify that. So you're referring to the independence of observations? Yeah. yeah, yeah, so that's, that's a good point. You have to assume that all your observations are independent. So, you know, you can't have observations that come from the same person sort of thing because they would be correlated with each other, in which case that, in which case this quantity is more complicated to, to calculate. Thank you. Okay, so one of the simplest statistical tests that we can perform is um, something that I talked about in our McGill grad student IQ example, and that is testing whether our population mean is equal to some fixed quantity. So in this case, we can write our hypotheses in this way. Our null is just that our population mean is equal to the value C, and our alternate hypothesis is that the population quantity, the population average mu is not equal to a fixed value C. So as I said, we don't know, we don't usually know the true value of the population standard devi deviation sigma, and so um, in that case, this test, assuming normally distributed data, is called a one sample t test. And there's a version where if we do know the standard deviation, it's called a z test. Um, I'm, I'm just not going to get into that because you will almost always see a t test done. The z test is something that you just don't see very often. It's uh, something that always gets covered in an introductory stats course, but I don't think. Uh, you're going to get much out of it if I actually present it here. So I'm just going to go straight for our one sample t-test where we, instead of using sigma, we just plug in our sample standard deviation s. Okay, so we start out with some assumptions of our one sample t-test. So the, the main assumptions are, um, so we assume that all of our underlying observations come from uh, a normal distribution, so that so the population that we're studying is a normal distribution. So that's kind of a, a default um, assumption for the one sample t-test, but it actually turns out that the t-test is pretty robust to, to deviations from a normal distribution. There's something called um, the central limit theorem, which says that if we have um, a large sample size n, even if our data don't come from a normal distribution, then the distribution of that uh, sample mean x bar is still going to be approximately normal. Um, so if we have a large enough sample size, and we, but we're not confident that our data come from a normal distribution, you can still often use a t-test. And unfortunately, um, it's difficult to say for sure how large a sample size you would need to be able to do this. Um, really, I, there are some statistical tests out there which you would be able to perform, which, um, to be honest with you, I don't know much about them. But usually, it's a case of, you know, if your sample size is getting into the, into the hundreds, probably you can just go ahead and use uh, a t-test. So, um, as mentioned earlier, we have to assume that all of our observations are independent. So there is no like correlation between our observations. What, the value of one observation can't influence the value of another observation in our study. And the last assumption is that there are no significant outliers. So we just have kind of all our data more or less in a, a sort of contiguous block. All right, so the test statistic for the one sample t-test is just going to be this thing. So in the numerator, you can see 
we have x bar minus c. So we're just measuring how far away our, uh, our sample mean is from, how far away our sample mean is from this supposed quantity c. Um, and the other thing we have on the numerator is this standard error of the mean. And so if this thing is large in absolute value, so of course if, if, x, if x bar is uh, greater than c, then this thing is going to be positive. If x bar is less than c, then this thing is going to be negative. So if this uh, quantity t is large in absolute value, then that means our sample mean x bar is far away from uh, this null, null hypothesis value c relative to this um, overall amount of variation. So you can see that even if this x bar was very far away from c, if you had a large amount of variation in your data, you still wouldn't be that confident that x bar differs from c. Okay, so we have this value of t, we have this test statistic, which kind of gives us a measurement of confidence, but we need to um, define a threshold to make a decision on whether or not we're going to reject or to not reject our null hypothesis. Okay, so as it turns out, so we're going back into the world of taking you know, theoretical, like a large number of repeated samples from our population. So if we took lots and lots and lots of samples, all of size n from our population, and we calculated this value t in each of these samples, then it follows what's called a t distribution. So a t distribution looks a lot like a normal distribution. It's, you know, bell-shaped, but the tails in the t distribution tend to be a little bit heavier. So that's actually going to end up accounting for the fact that we plugged in um, an estimate of sigma here instead of using the real value of sigma. So the point is if, if x bar is equal to c, then this whole quantity is equal to zero. So we fall right in the middle of this t distribution. But um, if x bar is far away from c, x bar is greater than c, then we're going to fall over in the tail, in the right tail of this distribution. And if x bar is less than c, then we're going to fall over in the left tail of this distribution. But the important thing to remember is that this t distribution is something that would only be true under the null hypothesis. Um, so if our if our sample, if our population mean mu were truly equal to this value of c, and we um, and we took repeated samples and calculated t, then this is what the distribution would look like. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to look at the value of t that we get in our sample and see how far away it falls from zero on this distribution. And one more thing I'll, I'll mention about the t distribution is that uh, the width or the, the variation of this t distribution is determined by the sample size, something called degrees of freedom. So uh, in our case, we would plug in n minus one, so sample size minus one degrees of freedom, and that's just gonna change sort of the shape of this t distribution. But so the point is that, so we, as I said, we start by assuming that the null hypothesis is true and we see how likely the result that we got would be under that null hypothesis. How, how likely that result or a more extreme result would be under that null hypothesis. Um, so if the probability of getting, our, of getting our observed result or a more extreme result under the null hypothesis is very small, then we're less likely to believe the null, the null hypothesis is true and maybe lean more towards our, our alternate hypothesis. So we choose this thing, so, so this probability that we compare to, so we want to compare the probability of our, of our 
of getting our result or a more extreme result. So we want to compare that to another probability alpha. And if it's less than alpha, then we would consider that probability to be small and we would reject our null hypothesis. And so alpha is called the significance level of the test. It's something that we determine a priori. And a smaller value of alpha means it's going to be harder to reject that null hypothesis. It's going to be a more strict threshold. Um, and so as I'm sure most of you know, by convention, we often choose alpha equals to 0 0.05. So kind of um, one in 20. But it should be noted that this is just completely arbitrary. This, there's nothing special about the value 0.05. Um, in fact, the reason why the, the value 0 0.05 was used um, was because it was a convenient value in, in statistical tables. Uh, when, when you had, back in the day before we had statistical software, um, you always had to refer to these tail probabilities through statistical tables, and so they only had fixed quantities like 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.01. And so really that's the only reason why we use alpha equals 0 0.05. Okay, so as I said, so we want to look at our T statistic and see if it falls in either extreme of this T distribution. And the thing is that because this T distribution is symmetric, you know, it's the same on both sides, that all we have to do is take the absolute value of our t-statistic. So if it has a negative sign, we just drop the negative sign. And then we compare everything to the upper tail. So rather than, rather than comparing to both tails, we just would take any t-value that we find and just flip it over to the positive side and compare to the upper tail of this distribution. Okay, so here's um, just a little diagram of a T distribution. And so what we do is once we have our degrees of freedom, so as I said, just determined by, by our sample size, then we would look and we would find the tail probability of alpha. So most commonly just 0 0.05. And we would find the, the value along this axis that corresponds to a tail probability of 0 0.05. So we just call that a critical value. So it's going to depend on our degrees of freedom and it's gonna depend on our significance threshold alpha. So this, can be, this is something that can be found using statistical tables, can be found using statistical software like R, but of course, when we go do these things in software like SPSS, we don't really have to worry about these things. It does all of this for us. All right, so there was a lot of kind of background to this one sample t-test, but if there's one thing you should remember, it's just this procedure for actually doing your one sample t-test, and it's actually very easy. So all you do is we start as we did before in the last lecture, we would calculate our sample mean X bar and our sample standard deviation S, and we would just calculate our T statistic as I defined before. We, so we have our significance level somewhere between zero and one. And so we look at the absolute value of T and we just compare it to this critical value that we get from a table or from software. So if the absolute value of our statistic T is greater than that critical value, then we think we have enough evidence against our null hypothesis to, in favor of the alternate hypothesis, and so we would reject our null hypothesis. And if it's less than that value, then we do not reject the null hypothesis. And so th this is just a very simple uh, type of 
uh, statistical test that you can do. Many statistical tests are kind of set up in this format. So if I, I'm just going to give a very quick example here. Um, let's say we have um, systolic blood pressure for a sample of uh, 50 medical residents at the, at the Jewish General Hospital. And we get a sample average, X bar is equal to 128. And a standard deviation, a sample standard deviation is S equal to nine. And assume that um, the average blood pressure for medical residents across Canada is 120. I don't know if these are realistic numbers. I just pulled these numbers out of thin air, by the way. Um, so we just assume that, it's a, that the uh, population of, the, sorry, that the average over all medical residents in Canada is 120, and we want to compare uh, the blood pressure uh, of residents at the Jewish General with that value of 120. So we set up our, our hypotheses. Mu equals 120 is our null hypothesis, and um, mu is not equal to 120 is our uh, alternate hypothesis. I'll choose um, a significance level alpha equals 0 0.05. And so I calculate my T statistic. So I just take X bar minus 120 divided by our standard error of the mean. And we get 6.29. And if I were to calculate our critical value, so alpha is 0 0.05 and sample size is N minus 1. So 50 minus 1 is 49. So we get our value of 1.68, and so it's just as simple as comparing our value to the critical value. So since our T statistic is greater than the critical value, we would reject the null hypothesis. So we have evidence in favor of um, the blood pressure in residents at the JGH as being different than that of residents across Canada. Okay, so that's sort of the, 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 the most basic way that we set up the one sample t-test. But the thing that people tend to report more often, well, I, I guess this t-statistic does get reported very often, but the thing that people tend to focus on is the p-value, which I'm sure everyone has heard of. And with p-values, um, one of the reasons they're so popular is that their interpretation is basically standard across all statistical tests. Um, it doesn't matter if you're doing um, a, a one-sample t-test, a two-sample t-test, an ANOVA, linear regression, that sort of thing. The p-value, you know, a small p-value always means a more significant result. And as I'm, I'm going to give you a slide which shows that we do have to be careful with p-values, in particular our interpretation of p-values. So the way I like to illustrate this is through an example uh, of coin flips. So let's say we want to test whether or not a coin is a fair coin. So whether this coin has an equal chance of coming up heads versus tails. Um, so we can do an experiment to test this hypothesis. So let's say you're, like me, you're a statistician, you have nothing better to do, so you just decide to flip a, a coin 100 times. And we end up with getting 55 heads in our sample. So what we do is we consider if this coin truly were a fair coin, equal chance of coming up heads and tails, then our probability of getting 55 heads or more is around 13%. Okay, so that doesn't, so 13% is kind of a small probability, but it's not that small. You know, it's between, that's gonna happen between one, one in seven and one in eight times that we perform this experiment. So if we did get that result, we wouldn't, I wouldn't be very confident in saying that the coin is not a fair coin. This would, be a very uh, this would be a viable result to get under a fair coin. However, if you suppose we had seen 65 heads instead of 55, 
and we calculate the same probability, prob probability that we get 65 heads or more, then this same probability would be 0.08%. So that seems like a, a pretty small probability. And in this case, I would say, okay, under a fair coin, this, uh, this outcome would be very, very unlikely. And so I'm more likely to believe that the coin is not in fact a fair coin. So this probability that I calculated is literally just a p-value. So the definition of a p-value is the probability, and I put this in bold because it's important, the probability under the null hypothesis that we would get the result that we got or a more extreme result. So if under the null hypothesis that probability is small, then we consider that to be evidence against our null hypothesis. And so again, we have this problem of where do we put our cutoff point? Well, we, um, as before, we can choose a significance level alpha and compare our p-value against this value alpha. So if we for back to this diagram, so before what we were doing is we were fixing this, this alpha and looking at where our t statistic falls along this axis. Now what we're doing is we're uh, calculating our t-statistic and seeing what the probability above that t-statistic is. And so that's just going to give us our p-value. And actually there's a, an important detail that uh, I'll just quickly note. We, we have to take uh, twice that probability because we did, remember we flipped over um, all of those negative values to the positive side. But again, that's something that our software is just going to take care of for us. Okay, so back in our blood pressure example, we had already calculated our value of T, 6.29. So I just went into my favorite st statistical software, R, and calculated that tail probability above 6.29 multiplied it by two, and I got my p-value of 8.34 times 10 to the minus eight. And so that value is way smaller than alpha equals 0 0.05. And so in this case, we would also reject our null hypothesis. And as it turns out, doing this procedure is exactly equivalent to doing the, the critical value version of the procedure. You're always going to get exactly the same answer if you do this one way or the other. Okay, so we define what p-values are, so let's just be careful. Let's talk about what p-values are not. So some, sometimes you see it written that the p-value is the probability that the null hypothesis is true. That's, that's not correct. Sometimes you'll see, you know, if uh, someone's... Um, if someone rejects their null hypothesis, they get a p-value of 0 0.02, they'll say, oh, okay, then the probability that, our, that the null hypothesis is in fact true is 0 0.02. Well, that, that, that's just completely wrong. You have to be careful. The p-value is the probability given the null hypothesis that we got our result or a more extreme result. The, the key is that it's a, a probability in kind of a... Um, in a world where that null hypothesis is true. And in fact, the p-value doesn't tell us whether either hy hypothesis is true. All it is is just a measure of evidence in favor of one or the other. Similarly, the p-value doesn't tell us anything about effect size. So if we go back to our example of comparing the means of two groups, um, a very, very, very small p-value doesn't mean that the difference between those groups is big or something important. It just tells us about evidence against our null hypothesis. So you could have a very, very small difference 
in means between two groups, um, but also a very small p-value. Um, and going back to my point about alpha, p less than 0 0.05 does not mean anything particularly special. This significance threshold was arbitrary. Um, I saw a really good talk last week uh, in the biostat department, uh, someone named Jeff Leake from, he's a, a very well-known biostatistician from Johns Hopkins, and he was showing um, distributions of p-values in, in uh, distribution of 3.5 million p-values found uh, in the literature. And you can see that there's always this spike just right below 0 0.05 because um, of what we call p-hacking, where we try a whole bunch of um, different statistical tests. We, in, we include different variables in our models and try a whole bunch of different things, and we stop whenever we see p is less than 0 0.05. So the important thing to remember is this really doesn't mean anything special. It was just an arbitrary threshold. Okay, another important measure is something called a confidence interval. Um, so in a confidence interval, again, something that's very, very useful, we have, uh, we usually put it in, in parentheses. So we have a lower value and an upper value. And when we construct this, we're confident to a certain extent that this interval is going to contain the true value of the population parameter. And so we normally express our level of confidence through some percentage. So for example, the most common one would be your 95% confidence interval. And so that, so the way we interpret that is that back to, um, back to our sort of uh, scenario where we're taking repeated samples from our population, a large number of repeated samples from the population, if we calculated the confidence interval in each of those samples, we would expect about 95% of them to contain the true value of the population parameter. So here's just sort of an illustration of that. So if our true population mean is say mu, represented by the horizontal line, each of these confidence intervals, so the the value of the vertical axis is just the variable of interest. So all we do is we calculate an interval um, over and over again for different samples. And we see that sometimes one here, one here, and one down here, sometimes our interval is not going to contain the true value of interest. But if we set it up with a high enough confidence, then it should contain that true value most of the time. So in the t-test, the confidence interval is actually very easy to calculate. You just take your value of x bar, and you either add or subtract to, uh, a quantity based on the standard error of the mean and this critical value. Um, this is something that you'll rarely have to do um, by hand. I'll show you how to do this in SPSS. So if we looked in our blood pressure example and we want to calculate a 95% confidence interval, then we would get uh, 125.44 to 130.56. So that gives us sort of a viable region where we're uh, confident that the, the true population parameter falls somewhere in that region. And um, another thing we can do is, if you remember, we were comparing that, that mean in medical residents at the Jewish General Hospital to the, to the Canada-wide average of 120. Um, and so we can actually see whether or not this confidence interval overlaps with the value 120. So in this case, since 120 is, falls uh, outside of this confidence interval, then we can actually say that uh, we can reject our null hypothesis. So that's always true. If we're, 
If we consider our confidence interval and we compare and, and we see whether or not that confidence interval overlaps with our value, so if the if the value falls within the confidence interval, then we would not reject the null hypothesis. And if the value falls outside of the confidence interval, then we can reject the null hypothesis. So again, this method is completely equivalent to the p-value method and the, the critical value method of determining significance. And so these are some things that are often reported together. You sometimes report your test statistic. Uh, your, your p-value, and also your confidence interval. And one more thing I'll add about the confidence interval is, so if you choose a smaller value of alpha, so, a, um, so therefore a, a larger confidence interval, so you have a higher confidence that your population parameter is in that interval, then that corresponds to a wider confidence interval. So it makes sense. If, you're just, if you were to extend your confidence interval to be very, very, very wide, you would be very confident that your true population parameter falls within that interval. And if the value of this, um, if the value of this percentage gets a little bit lower, then, um, then your confidence interval is getting narrower, and you're less and less confident that the interval contains your true population parameter. Okay, so that's our one sample t-test. So the last thing I'm going to talk about before our tutorial is the independent samples t-test, so how to test the means between two, uh, two independent samples. Uh, but before I go on, are there any uh, questions? From a, <clears throat> from a hypothetical point of view, it seems to me the confidence interval is more visually pleasing because it gives you an idea of the <coughs> interval from the means or from the other population, whereas the p-value depends upon the calculations and you don't see that necessarily unless they give you both. Any value in re uh, reporting one versus the other? Um, so I've been told um, by professors in my department that confidence interval is generally something that we should go with. The, the, the p-value has become a standard, but really the confidence interval does indeed give you more information because, as you said, it gives you a kind of um, uh, a viable... Um, a viable range where you're confident that your parameter is. But also if you, so, so let's say you have this one case here where this confidence interval just barely overlaps with the value of mu. So in that case, because it overlaps mu, we would not reject the null hypothesis. Um, but you could imagine that maybe if we had taken uh, a larger sample, we would have been able to shrink that confidence interval by just a little bit. And, and in that case, uh, we would have declared that our result was significant. And so if you compare that to this confidence interval over here where it sort of falls right in the middle, it's, it's not obvious what would happen if you were to take uh, a larger sample size. So. Basically, a confidence interval can kind of give you an idea, okay, in this case, our study might be what's called underpowered, which means that if we had taken kind of a, a slightly bigger sample size, then we would have found something that was significant. So yeah, I, I would agree that generally I would report the confidence interval over the p-value. So I imagine um, in uh, maybe a few lectures from now, you'll actually talk about how you actually set up an experiment in terms of an appropriate sample size so these issues don't happen, right? Yes, exactly, yeah. So in that last lecture, okay. that's when I'm going to do that. Okay, so our independent samples t-test. So going back to our first lecture, we had seen this, this histogram of uh, mouse weight from uh, the International Mouse Phenotype Consortium. 
and I had separated it out by male and female mice. So we see the male distribution on the right side here in blue and the female distribution on the left side. So the type of hypothesis test we're going to look at now is comparing the, the means, the mean mouse weight in grams between these two distributions. And okay, so this is exactly the independent sample t-test if you assume that the data come from a normal distribution. Um, so let's say we call these groups just group, uh, group one and group two. So I'll call group one is just the male mice and group two is the female mice. And so assume the the true means for each of these groups is mu1 and mu2. Then our null hypothesis is going to be that mu1 is equal to mu2, and our alternate hypothesis is going to be that mu1 is not equal to mu2. Um, an equivalent way to write this is null hypothesis is mu1 minus mu2 is equal to zero. The difference between the, mu, the, between the means is equal to zero. And alternate hypothesis, mu1 minus mu2 is not equal to zero. Okay, so assumptions of the independent sample t-test, very similar to the one sample t-test. Um, so we have to assume that the underlying uh, observations in each group come from a normal distribution. So it's a little bit stronger than before. Before we just assumed um, everyone is a normal distribution. In, in this case, it's just that there's one normal distribution in one group and a normal distribution in the other group. Um, the simplest, uh, in the simplest version of this independent samples t-test, we also have to assume that the variance is equal between the two groups. That's what I'm uh, going to show you today, the version of the test where we assume the variances are equal. But there is another version of the test where you don't have to assume that. Um, so we have to have independence of our observations and in this case we need independence between observations within each of our groups and every data point needs to be independent from every other data point in the other group. And again we have this no significant outliers um, assumption so most of our data falls into kind of like one contiguous block. All right, so I'm going to give you the, the formula for the independent samples t-test. This is only for reference only. Um, this is something that I would never calculate by hand ever. Um, but so assume that our sample size in each group is uh, N1 and N2, and our sample means are X1 bar and X2 bar. And I forgot to put in the sample variances, but the sample variances in each group are S1 and S2. Then our test statistic is going to be this. So we see the same thing, or a similar thing as before. So the quantity that we're interested in, we have in the numerator. So just the difference between the two means. And then in the denominator, we just have some measure of variation. And so, if the numerator is large relative to that measure of variation, then we are more confident that the means differ between these two groups. And so the value of um, the denominator is just this uh, kind of nasty quantity. It's called the, the, pooled, um, the pooled standard deviation. But as, I, as I said, um, this is something that you would normally run through something like SPSS. But doing this test is very similar to how we would do the one sample t-test. So I'm going to just illustrate with our mice example. So in our example, we had 467 female mice, 454 male mice. And the mean in each group is in the male mice, we have 27 grams. And for the female mice, we have 22 grams. So if you calculate the difference between these two, 4.81. So that's just the, the numerator of this t-statistic. 
So that value by itself, we don't know whether that is going to be a significant result. So we have to scale it down by dividing out this, um, this variance measure. So if you were to plug this into your software, you would get a p-value, a very, very small p-value. In fact, in, in R, it got rounded off to just 1 times 10 to the minus 16, so it's less than that, in fact. And so that would imply uh, a significant difference in means between these two groups at significance level alpha, alpha equals 0 0.05 or at a much smaller significance level of alpha. And again, we can calculate a confidence interval, I'll show you how to do this in SPSS. And in this case, what we're comparing the confidence interval to is the value zero. So remember if, um, if the difference is equal to zero, then that means that the two means are equal. So in this case, because our confidence interval does not overlap with zero, then we can reject our null hypothesis and we have evidence that the, the means between male mice and female mice for, in terms of body weight is significantly different. Okay, so we saw a lot here today. I'm gonna to show you, once again, it, it's very easy to run all these methods in, um, in SPSS. But the important things you need to remember are, so one, you should always be clear about what parameters you're studying and what actual test you're performing. So are you performing, are, are you looking at the value of the mean to some fixed quantity or are you comparing the means between two groups? Just very, always be very clear about what you're doing. Um, so determining st significance, um, pretty much in all cases is always going to involve looking at a parameter estimate. Um, it's going to look at sort of the theoretical variance of this parameter estimate and if, if we could take repeated samples and it's going to consider the sample size of your study. So. The most important point here is you don't have to worry very much about all the calculations I've shown. I've just showed, I've shown them for the sake of completeness. Um, it's very easy to run these things in SPSS. So what you should focus on is knowing how to properly interpret these p-values and these confidence intervals. Um, because it's going to help you in, say, writing be better publications. It's going to help you in understanding what, uh, what you see when you read publications. Okay, so that's everything. Uh, before we go on to the tutorial, like usual, I can do a quick question and answer session. Um. So I have two then. One, um, so you mentioned in the second example that one of the assumptions is that there's no significant outliers. But in biology, there quite usually are. Yeah. So can you comment on that? Yeah, so in that case, um, there's a few things you can do. Um, there's a whole range of tests called non-parametric tests where you, you wouldn't assume any sort of um, uh, normal distribution or, or, or any statistical distribution whatsoever and so you can usually go for for non-parametric tests if you have bad outliers. Okay. And the second question is when we use these statistical programs one of the first things we're asked is is this going to be a paired or an unpaired t-test? Yeah so so I just unfortunately didn't have enough time to get into that um, paired t-test. Um, but that's a good point. So what I uh, show you here in the independent sample t-test, as I mentioned, um, we have to assume that the data observations are independent across groups. But sometimes what we, what we might have is we might have something like repeated measures where we have a baseline measure and then, I don't know, like a, a post-treatment measure. And so we wanna compare individual by individual. Well, in that case, uh, 
the, the two samples that you take from each individual are going to be correlated. They're not going to be independent, and so you have to use um, another test called uh, a paired samples t-test, um, which is uh, something that's actually very easy to run, but um, yeah, I unfortunately just didn't have enough time to get into it today. Maybe I can work it in somewhere else if you think uh, that would be important to go through. So um, I think a lot of the softwares um, propose we do post hoc tests to make sure that the assumptions we did were, are correct. Can you comment on that and what we should do depending on the answers? Um, so I guess there are different tests you can do. You can always check for normality in your samples. Um, there are tests for, I don't know if there's a way you can really test for independence within your samples. I think the independence assumption is something that you have to think about more conceptually. I think they also look at variance if you compare two groups. Yeah, yeah, so you can look at the variance between the two groups, but as I mentioned, there is a version of the t-test where that doesn't have to be true, where you can have different variances. Um, and in fact, in SPSS, it automatically tests the variance between those two groups, so. Um, but so, I, I mean, my comment on that would be, yeah, you should always do whatever you can to, um, to verify whether or not your assumptions are true. Um, in practice, sometimes things get glazed over a little bit. In, in particular, that no outliers one that Josie just mentioned, probably most people don't even really, I guess that assumption doesn't even appear on their radar, even though it is something that we do have to assume in a t-test. Thank you. Uh, let me ask a quick question while I'm walking. Um, oftentimes students are confused as to whether or not they should be presenting data as SEM or SD, so standard deviation versus standard error of the mean. Can you comment on when one, one would be more appropriate than the other? So, Standard deviation, so let's just review the difference between those two things. So standard deviation is the variation of all the samples in your data, and standard error of the mean is like this theoretical um, variation of all possible sample means that you could take. So let's say it, in a publication you're doing something like a, like a a table one where you're just doing a, a summary of all, of, all your of all the data and all the variables that you have. In that case, you're just reporting statistics to kind of give a description of um, all the data you have. So in that case, I would use the, the standard deviation because you're just reporting that to give um, a, a, a general idea of how spread out a variable would be. And if, say, you were to do something like, let's say you were creating a table where you had, where you specifically wanted to compare the means between two different groups. So you have the, the mean of group one reported and the mean of group two reported. And the idea of that table is to illustrate the difference between those two groups. Then I would report the standard error of the mean because that is the more relevant quantity. And, I, and sometimes what you'll see is you'll see um, uh, uh, a bar, uh, a bar chart where, where you'll have the mean of, of one group represented by a vertical bar and the mean of another group represented by another vert vertical bar. And you'll see there will be these little error bars within each bar that gives you an idea of kind of the, of the variation in your estimate. And that is often the, the standard error of, of the mean, the, the, the half the width of that bar. Okay. So I just wanted to follow Josie's question about the outlier. So in case you have an outlier, you cannot just do a statistic, statistical method to exclude the outlier, and then you still can use the parametric method and instead of going to non-parametric, or if you have an outlier, you directly go to the parametric method. So outliers are tricky because so I guess there are sort of two kinds of outliers. One outlier would be something where you look at that outlier and you think, 
that doesn't seem right. That shouldn't be a valid observation. So you think maybe there was something like instrument error, or if you were taking a survey, maybe somebody, or maybe there's a typo or something like that. So in that case, you would be completely justified in removing that outlier because you think that it's not a valid observation. But if you have no evidence for or against that being a valid observation, and you kind of want to remove it because it's just far away from your data, well, I would say in general that's something that you should not do. Um, you can do it, but you just have to be careful of the implication of that because when you do remove that value, you are very slightly changing the population that you're studying. And in, in some cases, that outlier could be a very important value and it could drastically change um, the value of your estimates. So like everything in statistics, the answer is it depends. There's really no, you, you always have to, I guess you can never blindly follow any sort of procedures for these sort of things. You always have to think about what context you're working in before you can make a decision like that. And it could be giving you new information you didn't know. Yes, exactly. It could be. Yeah, exactly. If you, for those of you who didn't hear, Josie just said that could be giving you more information about um, you know, a group or individuals that you didn't know existed before. Okay, so, so we'll move on to the tutorial. It's going to be very quick again, so you're almost free. Okay, so as I said, um, so we're, we're working on the same uh, data sets as, as the last one. So just to remind you, this is just a data set. It's a publicly available data set from, the, uh, from a package in the R statistical language. Um, and it's just um, uh, a sample of women with, um, with and without uh, diabetes. We have just things like uh, measures like plasma glucose concentration, diastolic blood pressure. Um, we have a yes, no, whether or not they're diabetic. We have the BMI categorized into a lower BMI and a higher BMI. Just some simple things like that. So the first thing I'm going to show is, um, I, think, I think what I decided to look at was uh, this blood pressure. So I'm gonna show the, uh, the one sample t-test. So to run a one sample t-test, it's uh, basically every, every statistical test that you do in SPSS is going to be underneath this analyze menu at the top. And so if you go to compare means, you can see that we have this option for one sample t-test. So if we click on that, we get a similar sort of window to what we saw last time. We have all our possible variables on the left side, and we just move the relevant ones over to this right side to perform our statistical tests. So in this case, I'm interested in this blood pressure, and so I move that over to the right side. And down here we specify the test value. So that's just the value C that I had referred to in that uh, one sample t-test. And so in this case I could just test it against 80, just kind of an arbitrary value just to illustrate how to run the test. So we're going to test whether or not the mean blood pressure is significantly different from 80. Um, so it's just as simple as pressing OK. It's going to open up our output window. Usually SPSS will give you um, some initial uh, sort of sample statistics. So it gives us our sample size n, it, uh, which is 200 in this case, it gives us our sample mean, which is 71.26. It gives us our sample standard deviation, and it gives us our standard error of the mean. And so here is the output for our one sample t-test. So it'll specify your test value here at the top, which we 
uh, chose to be 80. It's going to give you your T value. Um, so this says that, so it's negative, so that means that our observed mean is smaller than the, than the test value of 80. And this significance is basically our P value. And one thing that SPSS does is it tends to, to round off P values. So, and any P value that's less than 0 0.001, it's just going to output as, as zero. Uh, that's something that you can change, but, um, but in this case, I'm just going to leave it at zero. So in that case, it's, if we were testing at level alpha equals 0 0.05, then we would declare a significant result. So we would declare that this sample mean of 71.26 is significantly different from 80. It's also, so it, SPSS also by default gives you confidence intervals. And the way they do it for the one sample test is really weird. They actually give you a confidence interval um, for the difference, when in reality most people would be more interested in the confidence interval of, of the mean itself. But you know, getting back there is, is actually not difficult. All you would have to do is just take your test value 80 and subtract or I guess technically you're adding on the lower and upper confidence intervals, and then that's going to give you the confidence interval of, of the mean. So I, I don't really know why they set it up this way, but, but it's not difficult to get back to your confidence interval of the mean. Okay, so I can also do uh, a two sample or an independent sample t-test. So it's under that same menu, analyze, compare means, and our independent samples t-test. It's a very familiar, um, very familiar window. So in this case, I'm going to test my blood pressure. Uh, yeah, yeah, my blood pressure. So I move that over to my test variables. And then there's another menu at the bottom where you choose whatever your grouping variable is. So if we go back to um, here, I'm going to use um, the, BMI, the BMI category. And so for each individual, there's either a value one or a value two. And so when, when you're doing this test, you just have to be aware of how this variable is actually coded. So in this case, it's just the number one versus the number two. Sometimes this could be like, um, like a word, like it could be the word male versus the word female or something like that. So you just have to be aware of how it's actually coded in order to run this test. Okay, so we have our blood pressure as our test variable. We have our BMI, which we're going to put in as our grouping variable. And you can see that there are kind of two question marks in here. That means it doesn't know yet what the two groups are called. So all we have to do is we just have to define our groups. And our two groups were just one and two. That's the way they were coded, one and two. And then it's going to do our t-test. So here um, we have a table for our independent samples t-test. So we, we're just gonna focus on the first row of this table. So over here, there's actually, on the left side, there's a, a test for equality of variances, which I won't get into, but um, you can read out more on that if you, if you want. But so in the first row, we have our significance as before, is equal to 0.01. So in that case, our p-value um, at level 0 0.05 is significant. So we would say that there is uh, a significant difference in blood pressure between the two BMI groups. We, it reports the mean difference, and it reports the standard error of the, of the difference, and most importantly, it reports uh, a confidence interval of this difference. So, so yeah, so some of those formulas that we saw before got a little bit tricky to work with, particularly the, particularly the one 
for the independent samples t-test, but as you can see, this is something that we can perform just in a few seconds. And the important thing is just to be able to interpret uh, the results of this t-test. Okay, so that's all I have for the tutorial. Do we have any questions about the tutorial? Just a question about the interval. You, you know that the p-value is 0 0.01, but yet you have wide confidence interval. Does that play a role in interpretation of your data in any way? Versus a narrow interval with the same so, so for a given sort of problem, for, for a given data set and a given test, yes, there's going to be correlation between the magnitude of that p-value and the width of the confidence interval, but in a more general sense, I'm not sure if there's any rule that we can define related to that. Um, really, really, it, it just makes more sense to look specifically at the confidence interval. You can't really extract much more information from the p-value other than significance, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, I just have a question about the confidence interval. Sure. Like you mentioned, should be like overlap between zero. Like, do you divide it by a certain number to get that? Um, uh, sorry, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Like you, you mentioned that it should should be overlap between the zero value. So what basically, if that? if if it overlaps with zero, mm -hmm. then that means that we would not reject our null hypothesis. So in this case, the confidence interval doesn't overlap zero. Both values are negative, and so we reject the null hypothesis. Okay. So that's what I mean by or that. Or either positive or negative. Like it, 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 it could be either be positive, either it could be sides. negative. Okay. Um, one could be positive, one could be negative. Mm -hmm. But you're just looking at whether or not it overlaps with zero to okay. determine significance. Perfect. Thank yeah. Sometimes we have uh, um, a problem when we are doing the stats. Uh, the program can uh, give us information that uh, normality or normalization was not passed. What does it mean? And uh, if we will change uh, our data, for example, we will do log, it can be passed after that, but uh, with original data, what, why we cannot pass this? Uh, so, sorry, what, what is the problem? It's a normalization? Yes, like no normalization. Um, and is this in a specific software? Is it in SPSS? Uh, no, this is uh, for the Sigma plot. OK. Um, I'm afraid I don't know what that normalization is referring to, unfortunately. Um, and uh, another question about the array under the curve. Uh, sometimes it's very important uh, like information that we can calculate. Is it possible to use the same um, uh, zero uh, hypothesis or something, this is absolutely different. Because in this hypothesis we have also sensitivity and specificity. This is, uh, looks like very similar or this calculation can be absolutely different. Uh, sorry, this calculation is different yes. from? Area under the curve. The area under the curve versus, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you're asking exactly. Okay, sorry. <laughs> And that's Any other questions? Okay, I think uh, that's great. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Just a reminder uh, before you all leave and before we thank Kevin again is that we're here next week, but then off the next week, just so you remember, so 10 o'clock Monday. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Thanks. Thanks.